what I want to do is, is, is not just talk about the book, but talk about the Club of Rome and our, our understanding of the world and where the world is going. Because we need to change, we need to change our, our views on the world and we need to change our economic system if we're going to survive the next few generations. It's that serious. The book, uh, as you can see, the English version here, we launched the German version about three weeks ago in Berlin. It's called a different, it's a different title. You can't read it there. It says Ein Prozent ist genug, which means 1% is enough. And the reason we called it that in German, it's actually a much better title. We had a bit of a fight with our publishers here for the English version, is because all it takes is us for to redistribute 1% of GDP, to shift it from what we're doing, which is bad, like producing coal and oil and gas, to spend 1% a year for the next 20 years, and we can shift the entire system into something which is sustainable. So we don't have a huge financial challenge ahead of us. We can manage it carefully, and 1% is enough. The other reason it's called 1% is enough is that we need to get used to 1% growth because it ain't going to come back as it was before. And there's nothing we can do to change that. No matter how much money we print, no matter how much we, we cut interest rates, we will never have the rates of growth that we saw for the last 30 for, or 40 years. Now, let me tell you something about the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome was founded in 1968 by a Scotsman uh, and an Italian, a Scotsman called Alexander King, who was a scientist. Uh, and they got together with a group of about 25 or 30 others because they had a concern about the future of humanity. Now, if you take yourself back to 1968, those of you that are old enough, the late 60s was a very optimistic time. We were exploring space. We were trying to put a man on the moon. It was 20 years after the end of the war. Hippie times were there. It seemed like the world was going in a very good direction. And yet here's this group of people got together and said, mm, there's a problem. And we got some money from the, the Volkswagen Foundation, and we went to MIT in the US, and we developed a model. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of it, a, a computer model to look at the future of the world. And the result of that was a book called The Limits to Growth. And The Limits to Growth is still the best-selling environmental book ever, 30 million copies in 16 different languages. Now, most people, when they, 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 they think about limits to growth, if they know about it at all, they think that it's to do with economic growth, and it's not. It's about what we call today the ecological footprint. It's about the growth of the human impact on the Earth. And what they did was they measured five different variables. The book actually has 12 scenarios, some positive, some negative. And they looked at these different variables and what would happen over 200 years. Non-renewable resource use, Population, industrial output, food output, and pollution. And they said, and this, is, this particular graph is, is one of the scenarios called the standard run three. And they said, if we don't change anything, then by around 2030, 2040, the entire system will collapse. Because there will be such a build up, too many people in the world producing too much pollution, using too many resources, and the system will eventually fall into collapse. And the book was very positive. It said, look, if we just change things a little bit, we should just slow the rate of population growth, we would just slow the rate of economic development, and slow the rate of throughput of resources, we can avoid that. We could go forward for hundreds of years without having this crisis. Now, unfortunately, people didn't listen to that. It was discussed at the UN, it was discussed in all sorts of government levels, and there was a big debate at the time, but it was rejected. Now, we've gone back every 10 years, and this is, this is 1972 when the book was published, and this is now. And we've gone back every 10 years, and we've tracked what's been happening. Now, what's happening today is exactly as we predicted, not slightly exactly. Everything is transiting out exactly as we anticipated. So we have a big, big problem, and I'll talk more about the consequences of that as we go. We now find ourselves in what we call overshoot. The, 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 the carrying capacity of the planet, if you think the capacity of the planet is here, it's a, got a certain ability to sustain life. Now, because we're damaging that planet, because we keep uh, filling it with pollution or digging up all sorts of things from the Earth's surface, we're actually reducing the capacity of the planet to sustain life. So that's actually going down. But because we're also pushing too hard on the growth lever, because we're using too many resources, we've passed through 
in fact, about 1985, we passed through the level of sustainability. And today, we live as if we have one and a half planet Earths. In fact, in some parts of the world, in, in, in Switzerland, for example, or in the US, we live as if we had four and a half planets. And if we carried on, then that's what would happen. And we can't do that. You can only do this for a short period of time. You can only live beyond the capacity of the Earth for a short period of time. Eventually, you'll have collapse, and which is what limits to growth is about. And so what we're doing in the Club of Rome is to try and say, how do we bring that back down? How do we bring the system back into balance in some sort of managed way so that we can come, come back and live in harmony with nature and, and, and society? Now, the consequences of this, the consequences of us living like this are two b major classes. First of all, environmental, and the most important one, the most important consequence by far is climate change. I'll talk a little bit more about climate change later on. I can talk about it all afternoon if you're really interested. But it is by far the most important consequence because if we don't fix that, then nothing else really matters. Species loss. We somehow think that that doesn't matter what we're killing off, but it really does. But it's also pollution of the air, the waterways, the soils and oceans. All of this is getting worse. And then destruction of the planet itself. So those are the, the, the environmental consequences of us pushing too hard on the levers. The social ones are just as important, and they often get much bigger headline news because people focus on the social consequences much more than the environmental ones. <coughs> Greater conflict because of rising inequality, drought, resources, and climate change. So that, for example, the Syrian conflict is hugely driven because of climate change. They've had eight years of drought in Syria, which forced a lot of people off the land into the cities, which caused different factions of, of, of groups to fight each other, which then rose into civil war. So a lot of that's been caused by climate change, and you see the same in much of North Africa today as well. The widening gap between rich and poor everywhere, I'll talk about that, and stubbornly high unemployment. Now, what we've done in this book, and what the Club of Rome is, is now changing its focus, because we used to look at, at trying to convince people to change their long-term perspective, is to try and get them to focus on short-term issues, to try and address the issues which concern them today, inequality and unemployment, but in clever ways which will also shift the long-term di direction. Why do we have these problems? Now, this is particularly meaningful for me because I used to work for The Economist. Now I'm embarrassed that I did work for them. Because it's the economic system that's at the root of all these problems. Our current neoliberal system, which drives this economic growth. And this little cartoon's from the book, and it says, yes, you're homeless, but this is great for GDP. Because in GDP terms, in economic terms, a storm which washes through a city and blows away half the houses, or a fire which is now destroying parts of a city in Israel, is great for GDP. We don't count the destruction, but we count the rebuilding, and we count that as positive for GDP. Growth, economic growth, is dependent on us increasing the amount of resources we use all the time. Growth and GDP are tied together, and resource use is tied to that as well. And if we have to increase the resource use every year, and every year it has to go up higher, that's what growth is, we have to increase the amount of energy we use. And if we increase the amount of energy we use, we create more and more CO2, which causes climate change. So the economic system is actually the cause of climate change. Because we want to have more growth, we use more and more resources, which requires more and more energy, which creates more and more CO2, which causes climate change. It's not just that the economic system is causing climate change. It also does a lot of things wrong. We think that growth creates jobs, we think that growth reduces inequality, and we think that growth solves poverty. It does none of those things. We believe wrongly that growth brings jobs. You can hear politicians all over the world saying, we need growth, we need growth to create jobs. It doesn't work. This is, this is the OECD, so this is the top richest countries in the world. This is GDP from 1990, through to 2015. We experienced some of the fastest growth in human history. <coughs> Spectacular rates of growth for 25 years. And you go back another 10, very high rates of growth as well. And look what's happened to unemployment. It went up. The reason for that are, are quite complicated, but it's all explained in here. 
But the reason for that is that growth is actually mostly from productivity improvements. You have to increase productivity all the time. And that means you have to squeeze more and more out of what you've got. And to do that, you have to get rid of people. You have to create unemployment. You bring in machines to make the goods more efficiently. So in the long term, a push for growth will actually increase unemployment, certainly in the rich world today. We also believe wrongly that growth reduces inequality. Inequality, so the gap between rich and poor. In economists measure this in something called the Gini coefficient. It's not very easy to read, so I'll explain it. But the Gini coefficient basically says, if the Gini coefficient is zero, then everybody in society is equal. They all have the same level of wealth. And if the Gini coefficient is one or 100, then one person has all the wealth and everybody else has nothing. Now, just to put that into some sort of perspective, in Europe today, the Gini coefficient is between 28 and 32. In China, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, where there was huge levels of equality, it was about 16. In the US or Hong Kong or Singapore, it's about 48. And in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 60 or 70. Huge levels of inequality. Now, if we look at the world Gini coefficient, in 1820, before, or the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, I mean, it started in Britain, but in the rest of Europe, it was only really just beginning then. It was 49. 200 years, nearly, of industrial development. All the growth of nearly 200 years. Everything that the economists tell you we need, and the Gini coefficient went up to 66. If you look at between country inequality, which is the gap between the rich world and the poor world, in 1820 it was 16. In 2000, 54. So the gap between the rich world, Europe, and places like India or Africa, is three times bigger today than it was before the Industrial Revolution. Neoliberal economists will always tell you that there's something called the trickle-down effect that when the rich get richer, it immediately or gradually trickles down into the pockets of the poor and nurtures everybody. It's simply not true. Thomas Piketty's famous book a few years ago about capital in the 21st century, really that's the main point it makes, that the wealth actually accumulates in the rich. The system is designed to do that. It moves money from the poor to the rich, and it moves money from the poor world to the rich world. And all these free, free trade agreements accelerate that process. So we're told that growth brings jobs, we're told that growth reduces inequality, and both those are lies. The third thing we're told is that growth helps reduce poverty. One of the, one of the quotes that The Economist is always giving is, is about how the, the last 30 years of growth has lifted a billion people out of poverty. The IMF and the World Bank are always saying the same thing too. A billion people lifted from poverty. Ah, the absolute numbers, that's true. If we look at 1980 to 2010, the quality threshold is people living in $1.25. In 1980, 1.9 billion people lived in poverty. That was 42% of the world's population. 2010, it had gone down to 1.2 billion and 18%. So economic growth has had a phenomenally beneficial impact on reducing poverty across the world. But take out China, because China really is a different case. It's pursued a very dogged industrial policy very successfully, and it's a you know, very big population. So China is a separate case. Take out China, and OK, the gain is less, but it's still there. But what the World Bank has not done is it's not accounted for inflation. In 1980, when it started measuring poverty, it started with a dollar a day. And then, about 18 years later, it changed it to $1.25 a day to take account of inflation. But that doesn't take account of inflation. If you actually take account of inflation, then in 2010, a dollar a day in 1980 was $2.65 in 2010. Today, it's nearly $2.90. And if you do that, then the number of people living in absolute poverty has gone up. Despite all this economic growth, more than half the world today lives in poverty. So this great economic system, which is supposed to be so beneficial for us all, which is supposed to solve all our problems, 
is not just creating economic havoc, it's also creating all this ecological havoc as well. Nearly 90% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. The problem is a mindset problem. <coughs> we believe that we have to have more all the time, just as a rabbit. We have to have more and more carrots. And this is causing all sorts of problems which we have to solve in the next 20 years. Let me just talk briefly about climate change. I, I, I've, I haven't taken all, I've taken all the slides that I normally have about climate change out because it, it's a long story. Would anybody like to explain to me what you think? I mean, we have this problem with CO2, but why is the planet heating up? Can anyone explain that? Why is the planet getting hotter? Yeah? Is it to do with the cooling phase melting? The, the cooling polar at the top. Yeah, so yeah. the polar ice cap or the melt, uh, ice caps melting, yeah. Any other suggestions? Yeah? We're burning too much. We're burning too much, yeah. Yeah? Potential of heat. Exactly. What happens is that every, every day we get enough heat from the sun to provide us with 10,000 times the amount of energy we need in a year. And all this energy is banging against the planet, and most of it bounces back off into space. But because we're burning fossil fuels, and because we're using nitrates in the soils, and because we're using landfill, which releases methane, all these gases are trapping a little bit of that heat and stopping it reflecting back up into space. And since 1780, the temperature of the planet has increased by an average of just over one degree. There's some dispute about one or 1.2. But, but it's gone up by one degree. And you think, wow, that's OK. My god, one degree, that's nothing. You know, I experience a one degree temperature change every year. And we talk about the IPCC talking about a two degree increase. And you think, well, that's all right. So we need to think about it a different way. The human body has an average temperature of 37. And if it goes up to 38, then that's classed as a fever. And two degrees up, our lives are in danger. And we need to think about the planet like that. A two degree increase takes us back more than 10 million years in climactic history. And a four degree increase would take us back more than 40 million years. A four degree increase would actually mean that all the ice on the planet will disappear. And it's estimated that m not many of us will survive that. But that's where we're heading. If we don't change what we're doing, by the end of this century, we will be at four degrees. And if we don't stop burning carbon fuel in the next 20 years, we'll pass by the two degree level in about 2040. So we have an urgent problem which we have to change. Now, for most of us living in Northern Europe, that's okay because Northern Europe will actually benefit from a lot of these, these changes in temperature in the next 40 or 50 years. But if you live in sub-Saharan Africa, or you live in Bangladesh, or you live in Indonesia, or you live in South America, it's going to be a very big problem. And the migration problem we have today in Europe is going to get a lot worse. So we have a big problem, and we have to try and find a way to fix it. And we have three basic alternatives. We can have some sort of people's revolution. We can rise up, and we can say, look, this economic system is toxic. We need to find a different path forward. Occupy was a little bit about that, but it didn't really work. And I would argue that's not going to work anyway. The people on the other side are very rich, they have a great deal of power, and they're very well armed. So that's not going to have any chance of success in my view. Secondly, we can do nothing, which is what we're doing today. We're doing nothing. We've had 22 meetings on climate change, we've done nothing. We're producing more CO2 today than we've ever produced before, and it's going up every year. <coughs> so if we do nothing, we will have collapse. And let's just make a quick point about collapse. Collapse does not mean that you wake up one day and the economic system is a wreck. It's not like the financial crisis. It doesn't mean that the, 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 the planet is suddenly a wasteland. Collapse takes a long time. It takes 20 or 30 years. It's a long, slow period of everything beginning to unravel, socially and environmentally. And if I go back to what I said at the beginning, <coughs> there's a lot of evidence that that process has begun. We haven't reached the worst of it yet, but they, we're seeing the, 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 the threads that hold society together come apart. 
And what we've got to do is try and find some way to bring them back together again. The third option is to find a gradual transition, to find some way to shift the economic system in such a way that it doesn't disrupt the status quo, it doesn't make things worse, and it doesn't upset the fat 1% who are going to lose out. And that's what this is about. This is about how do you find a way to gradually make a transition? Just before I go into a few of the ideas of that, why do we not act? We've got this urgent problem, which is completely understood, that we don't need any more evidence and yet we don't do anything about it. And I think there are five reasons. First of all, politics. We're stuck in an outdated industrial society logic, which is financially dependent on big business and maintaining the status quo. Too many people have a vested interest in nothing <coughs> changing. And so uh, it's in our view, and we've been working with governments for the last 40 years, that they are unlikely to make the change that is necessary. The politicians either don't get it, or if they get it, they can't do anything about it. Second reason is the vested interests. There are people who are funding all sorts of foundations around the world to make you think that climate change is not real, to make you think that the free market is a good thing, to make you think that growth reduces inequality. Big business is paying for a lot of this to happen. So the 1% is defending its position already very powerfully by confusing everybody. <coughs> so that's another reason change is difficult. Thirdly, and this goes way back to even people like Machiavelli, People are actually very frightened of change. People are frightened of something they don't understand. They're frightened of the future that's maybe going to be better. They'd rather have something that they know and can trust today, even if it's bad. So people are, tend to be short-termist, and they have a built-in inertia, a fear of change. Fourth, timing. When the Limits to Growth was published in 1972, we were too early. People were too s caught up in the, in the optimistic f fervor of perhaps the, still the end of the Second World War. It was too early. Now, whether or not the timing is right now, I don't know. But it's certainly a lot better than it was then. Wherever I travel in the world, more and more people get it. More and more people understand that we need to make some fundamental changes. We, worked, uh, we did a big project with the Vatican last year. We, we, we helped with that loud out to sea, the, the, the um, encyclical. And when you have somebody like that, 3.6 billion Catholics, beginning to waken up to the idea we need to change, you begin to get some leverage. So all over the world, we're beginning to see that change. Now, I don't think it's big enough yet, but it's certainly beginning to happen. Finally, the cost. There is a financial cost to making a transition to a better world. It costs more than doing nothing. And that also makes politicians nervous with uncertain returns way into the future, which in net present value terms, which is the way economists measure it, uh, are often very small. We have to make a transition. We have to change the energy system, for example, from something that's dirty and polluting and causing lots of problems to one that's clean. And that's going to cost a lot of money. Only 1% a year, but still, it's going to cost a lot of money. But no politician will see the benefit of that. Because built into the system within climate change, the, situ the situation will continue to get worse. No matter what we do now, for the next 20 years, it will get worse. And so you have to make some tough decisions knowing that the world will get in a worse situation than it is today. So we have a lot of reasons why we're not doing this. But of course, the more time we wait, the bigger the problem becomes. So this is our conclusion after all this soul searching, is we require a sizable group of informed citizens. We don't need 50%. We don't need half the world to agree to do this. We need enough to tip the balance. Now, that's probably 15 to 20 percent of the population. And policy initiatives that appeal to the short-term mindset of voters to gradually shift the economic system in a better direction. And that's what we're, we're putting our efforts into now. What do we not need? The number of times I give a presentation like this, and somebody always says, uh, first question is, what about technology? Technology will solve the problem. We don't need any technology. We have all the technology we need to solve these problems. We can, we can have a non-carbon energy system tomorrow. It just it costs a bit more. But that's our choice. If we want to choose a system which costs a bit more so that we can save the planet, actually the planet's fine, it's us that's screwed. <laughs> <laughs> but if we choose to do it, we can shift to a better system. We don't need technology. The only thing we probably do need a bit of technology for is something called carbon capture. The the 
IPC's forecast for how to bring down the amount of carbon in the atmosphere requires us to absorb carbon, to suck carbon out of the atmosphere for the next 50 years, or beyond 2050, for 50 years or more, to bring it back down into balance. And we don't have the technology to do that, apart from something called trees. Um, the second thing is we don't need, we don't need the free market. The free market cannot solve this. So the, the economists and politicians that say the market will solve the problem, it can't solve this problem. It's the cause of the problem. A lot of people around the world think we can have grassroots initiatives, we can have local communities becoming more connected with nature and we can build those up again. Those are great initiatives and I applaud them all, but it's not enough and it's not fast enough. So that's not enough either. And we don't need instant answers. We've had some of the finest minds thinking about this problem for the last 45 years. If it was an easy answer, we'd have found it by now. This is a complicated problem, and it requires a complicated set of solutions. But we don't need something which is a quick fix, because it just doesn't exist. What we need is to develop a transition, an economic transition to a better system over about 20 years to get people used to something better, which gradually shifts it from a system which is based on short-term profit and corporations to something which is for the benefit of wider society. OK, just before I finish, the book contains 13, 13 ways to shift the system. Twelve of them are, are focused on providing a short-term advantage for the majority of people, and one of them is focused on, on managing the population which is also absolutely key if we're to uh, reduce these problems. I, I'm not going to go into all of them, but let me just pick a couple of them. Sharing jobs. In the rich world today, if you go back to, to um, Keynes in the 1930s, he wrote an essay for his grandchildren. And he said, by the time my grandchildren are old enough, they'll be able to work just a few days a week. Because we'll have enough wealth, we'll have enough goods, we'll have enough of economic development that people won't need to work any longer. What he predicted has come true in the sense that we do have enough wealth. We have enough goods. If you take the GDP of Europe and divide it by the population, everybody has enough. The problem is it's badly distributed. The rich have too much and the poor have not enough. But the problem is not one of growth. We don't need growth to solve the problem. We need redistribution to solve the problem. And that's true all over the rich world. One way to do that is to appeal to the needs of the majority, to help them find a way to shift the political balance. Now, sharing jobs is one way to do that. We live in a situation today, we just take the US, where tens of millions of people are unemployed and tens of millions of people who would like to work full time have to work part time because there's not enough work. But if you take the people who are working full time, and you give them extra vacation, give them extra holiday, give them two days extra a year. And over 20 years, they get 40 days holiday. By doing that, just by gradually tweaking the system, you create enough space and you create time for that adjustment that you can absorb all the unemployment and not increase GDP. So you simply even it out over a 20 year period and you absorb all the unemployment and everybody has enough work if they want it and everybody has more leisure time on average than they do today. So you do something which is the benefit of the majority and therefore in a democratic system, if that functions and that's another question altogether, you should be able to shift or tip the balance in favour of the majority and against the corporations. Um, another idea called tax and dividend, this comes from a guy called Jim Hansen who was the first, he was a NASA scientist, he was the first person to tell Co the House of Congress about the seriousness of climate change. And his idea, if I explain it this way, is to say, if we put a dollar on a, ga a gallon of gasoline, we tax every gallon of gasoline at a dollar, and we collect all of that tax at the end of the year, and then we divide it by the population and we give every adult an equal share of that tax so that everybody has an incentive for that tax. They get a direct financial gain from it. That means that, on average, the average US citizen will get $550 a year. So a couple will get $1,100 a year. Now, for the poor, without a car, that's great. I get $1,100 for doing nothing. 
And for the rich, with the big gas guzzlers and two, two pickup trucks, they have a reason to start using less and less fuel. They have a reason to, to shift to smaller cars. And ev as that shift, tr that transition takes place, you put the tax up to encourage it to move further. And you can do that in all sorts of ways. But you make sure that when you tax something which is bad, you give it to the majority of people so that they have an incentive to want that thing. Another way to gradually shift the system. Third one, which is very obvious and really helping the poor world, is to restrict trade. We've got this bonkers idea that open and free markets is good for everyone. It's not. It's a way for corporations to move goods around the world for their advantage. That's the primary advantage of free trade. Now, there are times that it's very helpful, but for much of the poor world, free trade is a ticket to forever remaining poor. So we need to, we need to find a way to, to, to say to our politicians, let's not have free trade always. Higher corporate wealth taxes, that's pretty obvious. Finally, minimum wage. Some countries, Switzerland had a vote of, uh, a few months ago about providing a minimum wage for everybody, and they voted against it, which was a bit silly. But, but this is a theme which is coming up all over the world. There's one province in Canada which is now going to offer everybody a basic income all their lives of between four and $600. <coughs> this is an idea whose time will come. It's not quite there yet, but it's certainly getting there. We've done a calculation which says if you take taxes from the rich and you increase those, is it possible to give everybody a basic income for life? And our calculations show you can't. The rich are not rich enough to make that work. But what you can do is you can give it to everybody who really needs it. You can provide the unemployed, the sick, and the elderly with a basic income, a guaranteed basic income of about a third of the average, which is about $15,000, $20,000 a year. Every rich world society can afford to do that. And so that's the advantage of the majority. It also makes the transition to a better world easier. If people who work in the coal, oil, and gas industry lose their jobs, and they're guaranteed a basic income of about a third of the average, they don't have to live on the streets. They find a way that they can move to a better world. They, the transition becomes easier. So again, it's another way of providing an incentive to gradually shift the system. Now, the book's got 13 of them. If you're interested, you can read all about them in there. There's even a little presentation online with lots of cartoons that explain them as well. So I will left you, leave you to look at that if you're interested too. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Please go and tell the world that we need to change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graeme. That was absolutely fascinating and lots of provocative thoughts and ideas there to, to pick up on. I'm going to hand over now to Chick and Graeme to go into conversation about some of the, the ideas that Graeme shared with us. And then after that, we'll open up to the floor for questions. Okay, Chick. Thanks very much. Well, I, I can certainly recommend this book to everybody. It's um, a book I managed to get a copy of early and have read and have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a book in which I was struck by the the radicalism of the book, actually. Uh, and I was struck today by the kind of um, authority that comes from um, someone who comes from your own background in finance and banking, saying things which left-wing sociologists would also, would in the past have been kind of, you know, decried or castigated for. And that kind of made me think a little bit about your theme of change. And I wanted to ask you about change, first of all, at the individual level, because that's something that confronts us all. And I wanted to ask you maybe to share with us just a little about your own transition from being someone working at the hub of the dominant economic model to becoming someone who's a trenchant critic of it today. Uh, great. Um, the Club of Rome has, a, has about 100 members, and most of them are, are specialists in, in physics or, or, or chemistry or climate science or a few people who are experts in finance. They come from mostly around the world. And we have, um, we have 50 honorary members, most of whom are ex-heads of state, which help us get in, in, indoors. I, I, um, I'm one of only three members who came from the other side, who's not an environmentalist. And, and the reason I did that is because, as Chick said, I used to work in banking. I mean, I used to be on the other side. 
And then I worked for The Economist, which is promoting neoliberalism, and I worked in the auto industry. And um, in 2006, I started working in, in, in Hong Kong. And I started traveling around into China and, and, and Southeast Asia. And I could see the impact of economic growth. I could see the pollution. I could see the air pollution, the water pollution. And I could see that this urbanization was not actually doing a lot of good. If you go to places like Mumbai and you look at the shansi cans around, around places like Mumbai, you realize that this is not a good transition. And I could also see in 2006 that there was something going fundamentally wrong in the housing market in Europe and the US, that it was building up itself into a bubble. And it wasn't a secret that we could do something about it, that we could, we could change that. And, uh, and then the, the crash came. And I thought, you know, this didn't need to happen. We shouldn't have to have this. So I went to the editors of The Economist and I said, look, we have a responsibility here. We played a role in this. And we should at least be doing some analysis of why we got it wrong and doing some soul searching. And they didn't want to do that. And so I left. And, and I wrote a book, much great thanks to, to my wife, who, who gave me a lot, of, a lot of thinking. We went to live in Singapore, which just catalyzed my thinking even more, because the capitalist system is at its absolute peak in Singapore. And, and I wrote a book, and then I became involved with the Club of Rome, and now I, you know, I get it. So I'm like one of these people that's converted religion. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Okay, <laughs> okay. In favor of the coin there. Yeah. Um, moving on to kind of raise the theme of, you know, change at the individual level, change at the societal level. On the one hand, in your book, you're very scathing about what has become of democracy, and I actually brought the quote with me. You said, the rule of the market and democracy are mortal enemies, and to function efficiently, the market has to emasculate the democratic process. But yet, your solution leans heavily on the possibility of reigniting a kind of a democracy which yeah. can confront <coughs> the challenges which the market and its dominance has presented yeah. to us. Yeah. So I wonder if you could share with us a lot of your thoughts about how democracy gets reignited. Yeah. Um, we, we've made it clear in this book that we're working in an imperfect world. We don't have the tools that we need. And one of the, one of the imperfections is the democratic system because it's not functioning as it should function. Um, Jürgen Randers, who I wrote it with, was one of the original authors of Limits of Growth. And he's, he's really, um, apart from being a dying hard communist, um, has spent a lot of time in China. And, and he has this dichotomy in his head of being both very radically left and also believing that the communist system in China achieves much more because it's not democratic. And that we could solve all these problems without being democratic. But we have to work with what we've got. And so what we're now doing within the Club of Rome is also trying to, to change our message rather than speaking to the, 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 the politicians and those who influence them to try and make it much broader. We're trying to speak to a much bri brighter, 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 broader, not <laughs> public. So we're trying particularly to speak to young people, young people who are learning economics to try and help them understand that the economic system they're being taught is fundamentally toxic. So we're trying to, 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 to raise an activist sense amongst young people to, to demand change. The other thing, I mean, something like, like Trump to me is actually great news because it's going to make people very angry. And if they get angry, then, you know, they're going to start demanding change. You know, Brexit has also raised the temperature. What we've had so far is not enough reason to get people onto the streets. I mean, we had Occupy and nobody listened to that. And so now, again, people are going to get angry. So I think, actually, Trump is good news in the sense because people are beginning to, to, to demand change. OK, I'll come back to that, I think, yeah. with my last question, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> it's controversial, I know. <laughs> but um, I, I should maybe just say we've got copies of the book today. and They will be available to sign them at the end. And I, I think they're, they're normally £20. We have them for £10. Right. Right? So, Scottish um, price. It's a lovely, lovely hardback <laughs> book, so um, if, if people want to buy one at the end, it can, ha it can have them signed. Um, and this is a question, I guess, I guess about leadership, um, because your book shows how processes of change and transformation are driven by kind of more or less impersonal, macro-level economic structure and political processes, but at the same time, those processes are ultimately defined by leadership, their movements. Um, agents of change, parties, organisations. And the question, I guess, is, 
in the societies that you're talking about, the more or less rich world, to what extent are those agents of change already in existence? Do they need to be created? Do they just need to be brought together? It's certainly going to require a lot of different groups to work together, social organisations, trade unions, I think the church. It's going to be a, a coalition of unusual groups that need to come together to raise the temperature here. Uh, leadership, it's not going to be an individual or, or, or a party that's going to make the transition. If, you, if I always think about you know, Tolstoy's analysis of the Russian Revolution and, or, or, or Napoleon, rather, Napo the Napoleonic era, that Napoleon was not actually leader of what happened there. It was a whirl of historic events that happened to happen, had to happen, and that he was simply at the centre of the storm. And what we're seeing here is, is a build-up of, of momentum. What's happening is really, you know, started 20 or 30 years ago, and it will continue 20 or 30 years into the future. And it's a build-up of, 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 of voices that need to create that change. If I look around the world, if I give a talk in, in Germany or in Europe, most people get it. They understand that we need to make some fundamental changes. Most people are aware that even if they you know, want to get a new iPhone every six months, they know it's not really sustainable to live like that. They know that something fundamentally needs to change. And if you go to China, they know that they need to change as well. Different reason, because, because in China it's about maintaining social stability. It's about cleaning up the, the food system, about cleaning up the air system, about, about, about making the society more environmentally stable, because otherwise there would be political discontent. But the Chinese and the Europeans kind of get it. America, you know, that's a big problem. If I, if I give a talk, in America, the last time I gave a talk in America, the headline was, another little Marxist like Obama. <laughs> <laughs> but if we can get a coalition of the willing, if we can bring together the Europeans and the Chinese, and we can bring together groups like the Catholic Church and the trade unions, and we can bring together some students. You've got the beginnings of something happening there. I, I, we're too early there yet, but, but that's where we're pushing toward, bringing together a coalition of people that can begin to push, push the needle a bit. As I said, you don't need 50%. We don't need a majority, but we need enough people saying, this is not, this is not sustainable. Two, two more quick questions, Anna, if we've, if we've got time. The first one is about, in that process of change and the transition and the leadership of that, it's about the place of universities and I guess of institutions of education more generally. We've got people here from local colleges today and uh, pupils from local schools as well. And it's about the extent to which those institutions of education have been bound up to some extent with the creation of the problem and the role that they might play in terms of providing a solution to the problem. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've been doing several, for several years now is trying to develop a youth wing of the Club of Rome. Uh, we, we've, we've had several attempts at it because we realise that if we can get the people in their 20s and 30s to understand the scale of the problem, because they're going to have to live with the, 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 the consequences of, of the decisions my generation has made to screw it up, if we can encourage them to understand what needs to change, then we can, we can again raise the, raise the temperature. And so about 18 months ago, I started an initiative to try and work out how we could build this group and make it sustainable. And we focused on something called reclaim economics, to, to, to reclaim economics from the way it's being taught today. Um, we had our, our first meeting, Catherine uh, Trebek from Oxfam came to our first meeting in, in, in Austria a, a few weeks ago. And we brought together 27 young activists, people who are pushing for economic change, changing the way economics is taught. Some of them were were, were more about changing textbooks and about changing the sort of lectures that are given, and others were much more radical about disrupting the system. And what we found is that, that speaking to the economics departments is, is mostly a waste of time. They don't get it. They think that the neoliberal system is the only system. They don't understand that there's all sorts of other ways of approaching social development. It's not just a question of things like Marxist economics or feminist economics or environmental economics. That the, the goal of, of social development is not necessarily what they're teaching at all. And so what we're now doing is focusing our efforts on other departments to try and encourage them to either start running their own economics courses or to help them understand that when their students go along to economics lectures, they'll ask some awkward questions which the economics professors can't answer. So, so we're trying to 
to, to help universities. And a lot of this is because of, of people like you, Chick, coming along and saying, look, this is, there's something wrong here. We want, we want some help here. Uh, and so we're working with some, uh, Oxford is good, some German universities we're working with, Hajim Chang in, in Cambridge, Stieglitz is one of our members. We've got people that are beginning to, sh to, to help us to, to, to move the system, but this is very much at the beginning of this process. And it's only something which I think will gain momentum in the next couple of years. A final question is about looking back to limits of growth and the reports 1972, 1992 and uh, the 2012 report looked forward and envisaged the situation on the current trajectory in 2012. Yeah. I'm thinking about how you might want to look back and say 2022 or maybe 2032 and your comment about Trump kind of crystallised the thought in my mind. Yeah. To some extent we can look at UKIP in the UK or Trump in America and we can see that the reaction of a significant proportion of the electorate in these countries is less about trying to create and embrace a better future and about trying to kind of recreate, bring back a past, which in some respects wasn't that good anyway, but which we can't ever have even, you know, if we want to have it. And I'm wondering if you think that you will look back from the future and see the noughties, the decade of the noughties, as the moment at which people gave up in the future in the pursuit of a past which is unattainable, or on the other hand, as the last kind of dysfunctional, you know, statement of you know a wanting to have a past before people came to their senses and decided to create something better. Okay, about creating something better, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to, to 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 about what the world looks in 2050 to. Defining what we need. Defining what we should have is not that difficult. There are lots of groups who are talking about developing a new narrative and defining what a better economic system should look like. It's not that difficult. There are lo lots of basic ideas that we can accept. We have to live in harmony with nature. We have to make sure that we don't overstep the limits of the planet. And we have to have some way of, of making sure that the majority of people in the world can live in some sort of basic good standard of living. It's not terribly difficult. So defining what it is and defining the problem are not the problems. The real issue is how do we shift from here? How do we get away from here without making everything worse? And that's, that's I think, the biggest challenge that we're all struggling with. A lot of environmentalists will tell you how it should be, but they can't tell you how to get there. So the biggest challenge is how to shift from where we are. Now, Jürgen, his last book before this one was called 2052. And because he worked in the Limits to Growth model, there are certain, certain features of, of human society that have very, very long-term trends, which are very predictable. Population is the most obvious one. But it's very easy to predict long-term population demographic trends. But there are a number of others. Pollution is another one. The ones that are in limits to growth. And so what Jürgen did was he, he wanted to find out what's going to happen. And so his book, 2052, actually takes all these long-term trends and he shows this long period of, of kind of stagnation, and then actually beyond 2050 is when the really nasty things begin to happen. We're okay until then. Now, I, 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 I think in, in many ways he's wrong about this because, because we can change that. We can, we can shift to a different path if we want to. And it's not a question of knowing what that path is. It's a question of enough of us, enough of us saying enough. We need to change. And that's where I think we need to. I don't think we're there at the point where we can have that break, that rise up yet. But I think we're a lot, a lot closer than we were in 1972. And I hope that but if 2032 comes, I can look back and say, that happened. And it happened in the mid-20s, or it happened in the early 2020s, and it was because those voices became loud enough. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you for that conversation. That was very useful, raised a few interesting points. I'd like to open up to the floor now and uh, get some questions to, to Graham. Are you doing the mic? Okay, I was going to say. Well. <laughs> okay, um, Yeah, I've just got a question about the idea of a gradual approach in general. Yeah. Um, my understanding from what you were saying there was that the limits of growth argued largely like 
this this point, like this rough area of time, before <coughs> then we had to take a gradual approach to stop things getting to a point where we couldn't turn back, and this seemed to be the point that you're highlighting. So obviously, and from what you've said, you've not described a necessarily a traditionally a gradual approach, but it's certainly not a radical approach that some people are advocating. And is a, any sort of gradual approach enough if we're already past that point? Um, or do we have to be more radical? Good question. Um, as I th hope I make clear, what we're trying to do is provide an answer to the problem of how do we how do we do this without making things worse? How do we find a transition with which doesn't upset the whole apple cart? Because this growth engine has to keep running. If as soon as we stop the growth engine, everything goes haywire. But there are members of the Club of Rome who actually believe, and there are very intelligent, well-educated people who say this is not enough. We need to declare something like a state of war. We need to declare a situation which is much more similar to before a, a major conflict and suspend democracy and push, push decisions forward. And I have a lot of sympathy with that because some of the changes that are needed are going to be tough. We need to shut down the coal, oil and gas sector and we need to do that as fast as possible. We need to electrify practically everything and we need to shift to renewable energy. And making those decisions is extremely difficult in a democratic system. Now, we've tried to find a way to do that. I'm not, I'm not saying it's perfect. We know that there's a number of problems that, that make that very difficult. But it's the best we can work with right now. I don't have the ability to suspend democracy. I don't have the ability to, 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 to do what you're suggesting. But I can tell you, I, was at, I, I, I gave a talk at the UN about um, six weeks ago in Geneva. And I was asked to, to talk at an energy, tr energy transition group. And they wanted me to speak because being a Scotsman, I tend to be a bit blunt. And, and what they were saying is, look, we've had all these meetings. We've had all these discussions about climate change and nothing's happening. That sense of urgency is not there. The diplomats say, oh, you know, we have an e election next year and let's come back in Marrakesh and let's talk about it then. And they wanted somebody to say, look, this is urgent. We need to do something to raise the temperature. And what really shocked me was that in the room were all these representatives of the coal, oil, and gas industry. You know, this was not just diplomats. This was the fossil fuel industry defending their territory. So <laughs> one of the things I suggested, which didn't get me a lot of votes from them, was that we need to form uh, a recruitment business. And we need to find all these guys new jobs because they need to understand that what they've done in the last 30 years is tantamount you know, to, 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 to a war crime. They're going to kill us all. We need to thank them, find them different jobs. But unless we can do something else, <laughs> unless we can do something else, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to do what you're suggesting. The, the practicalities, we're trying to find a practical answer, but I do accept that we need to do something urgently. Yeah. Hello. Um, when do you suggest that Scottish universities should stop churning out useless lawyers and finance directors? <laughs> Scotland actually, uh, Scotland has a pretty good reputation in this whole area. And it's, 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 it's since, you know, since the parliament's been formed, its voice as, as, as a leading thinker in economic reform and in e environmental leadership is actually on the world stage pretty good. Uh, and and if if what I read I, mean, I, I don't live here but what, if I read in the papers is anything to go by you're moving in the right direction you know, there, there's a, an awakening here which goes back to Scotland's roots to 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 be about a better society not to be about the rich and to be about envir be environmentally responsible so I mean one of the other projects we're working on is to bring together seven governments, bring together a coalition of governments who can help us shift to a better direction, who can show a exa second example. And one of the ones we're talking about is the Scottish one. So, uh, you know, Scotland is a, it's not a bad place. I mean, I accept what you're saying about educating people for things that we don't need, but, but, but Scotland's in a good place.
Um, thank you. Um, I suppose my, my, what I'm going to say is a bit critical, so I'm a bit uh, cautious about how to phrase it. Um, and it's about what, what um, Chick mentioned about the agents of change. Um, so what, what I'm hearing, well, just to go back a little bit, when you talk about inequality and you talk about neoliberalism, for me, they're very much predicated by gender inequality and racial inequality. And if I hear somebody not addressing those issues, mm. I switch off because I'm thinking the solution that you're preferring is not going to change those things. What I hear you suggesting to me is a very top-down approach. And my activism over mm. many years has always been at a grassroots root level. And that, I think, is where real change can happen. I can't see it happening the way you're describing it. And I had a quick look to see the membership of the, the Wonders of Wi-Fi, the membership of the Club of Rome. So on the executive committee, there are 12. There are three women, and I don't think any uh, ethnic minority person I could be wrong. There are 103 members, mm -hmm. there are 24 women. Mm -hmm. And again, there's about four or five people from ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. So if the group that are offering a solution is coming at it from a very top-down, patriarchal, white patriarchal way, then for me, I'm out. I don't get it. Um, so I'd love you to change my mind mm -hmm. and offer um, more understanding about that. No, I, I mean, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I took over as Secretary General two years ago. Uh, it's something we need to change. Uh, we have a number of members who are, are very supportive of, of gender issues and, 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 and creating more balance. I think there's a, an issue of, of timing. I think we have to deal with the most urgent issues first of all. And if we don't save the planet, then we have to, you know, that's the most important one. Uh, but no, I, I mean, I take your point. I mean, we, we need to improve that, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I have the power in my hands. Uh, thank you. I pretty much going on the same lines. Uh, I heard a lot of things that could be changed by people who have by the one percent, basically what they can do. Yeah. Uh, what I didn't hear how I myself, as a woman, as a youth, whatever, uh, can do something on a daily basis. I didn't. Uh, you also said that. It, we should spread the words to people we know. So basically, I, re I really, really like your idea, but I didn't see uh, what can be done from the bottom up there once again. Okay. I mean, this activist thing and what can I do is a question which comes up a lot. And um, the, the, the honest answer is that as an individual, there's not much you can do. You can recycle your glass and you can recycle your paper and it's not going to make a b damn bit of difference. Um, what, in a world where 100 million more people are born every year, <coughs> what we do as individuals is very difficult to, sh to tip the balance. What we can yeah. do is be politically active. We can make sure that more and more people demand change. And that's the most important thing. That's the most important message, is to help other people understand how serious the situation is, to help them become politically active. We need a different sort of politician. We need to have younger people who can understand the scale of the cha transition that's necessary. It's political activism that'll change this. Recycling glass and, and, and you know, driving a, a, an electric car will actually make the situation worse in some cases. So individual action is, is much more difficult to do. It has to be collective action. I was really, thank you for that, it was really interesting. I was really interested to hear about your Reclaim Economics kind of um, <coughs> movement. Yeah. It seems to me that, you know, that I, you know I, I kind of support that, but it's not just a question of kind of reclaiming economics, for example, in universities, and it's great that you're here in a university, but I wonder if you think there may be a role for universities to actually become much more public again and take other kind of economic lectures out to the citizenry because if we don't do that you're not you're never going to be able to build the momentum that you want to build yeah. because neoclassical economics now is well, we've had I don't know more than a generation since Margaret Thatcher and it's not only economic issues I mean there are other kind of social issues like very rampant individualism rampant consumerism all of that stuff which you know can you know relates to economics but the young people are trained to believe that they have to invest in themselves, that they have to be 
you know, wealth maximizers and all of that kind of stuff. That there's, there must be a role here for universities to, you know, to take those ideas and take them out to the public, really to try to undo, you know, as I say, more than a generation of Thatcherism or neoliberalism. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I agree absolutely. I, it's a question of, of our resources and, and stages of going through. My objective is not actually to change the way economics is taught in universities. My objective is to change the way we think about economics in society. And the route to do that is through universities. So if we can persuade young students to understand that what they're being taught is dangerous and damaging to society and the environment, and they then tell their parents and their friends that something's fundamentally wrong, then we can begin to spread that message further out. We're also focusing our effort momentarily on, 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 on a geographic area, particularly Austria, Germany, Switzerland, because there are groups who are very active in that area. But the idea is to shift that gradually to the rest of Europe and then eventually to places like, not necessarily China or the US, but, but, but certainly to spread it more geographically. But the goal is not to shift just economic teaching universities. The goal is to shift the mindset of economics. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, it was really just pretty much in reference to the points that were just made there. Um, we have a dominant ideology of utility maximising the individual. And uh, the way that environmentalism has been articulated in the popular society, from as early as watching Blue Peter as a kid, you know, it's all about you, what you can do as an individual and stuff like that. And that to me seems to be the, the challenge. Um, and the, you've got to factor in the grassroots and all that sort of stuff as well. The people are actually impacted by the inequality of the world. It's a tough sell to sort of say to people, yeah, we need to change how we do things uh, um, to a whole segment of society who have never really reaped the benefits of it and all that sort of stuff. Um, so how do we go from being, like, just one little uh, example. I worked for a social enterprise organisation that deals with environmental issues and reducing the carbon footprint and stuff like that. And we had um, bins, lots and lots of different bins for, so that we as employees could, you know, do our bit as individuals within the, that context. The, the thing was, <laughs> the bins, when you actually put them all together, would have ended up in just two bins. So it was like ultimately like an exercise of utility. But it served the function of being able to, for us as utility maximising environmental um, individuals of feeling that we're doing something. Yeah. So how do we go against this ideology of us as individuals doing it towards more collective forms of doing things? It's a very good question as well. I mean, as I said, we've got two different groups working right now. One's about changing the textbooks and things. The other one is much more about activism, about disrupting economics lectures, about, about a die-in at university where all the students die because everything they're being taught is fatal. Um, <laughs> So there are active, I mean, we've got, maybe Catherine can talk about some of those because we've got quite a few of those ideas being developed, um, but disrupting lectures. And, 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 and Kate Rayworth at, at Oxford, she's got lots of ideas about vandalising textbooks as well. So. <laughs> because, because economics textbooks do not include nature. They don't include the planet or the environment. Just back to your point, though, about how does this change happen. Uh, reminds me of the point, the reason that we all believe that the neoliberal system is good is not accidental. And it's not some evolutionary process that we all get to this stage if, if, if we all live long enough. It's by design. In the 1940s, the late 1940s, a group of people met in Mont Pelerin in Switzerland and they formed something called the Mont Pelerin Society. And some of the 20th century's most famous economists were there, Hayek, Milton Friedman, and many others. You can, the, the society still exists today. And they deliberately set about changing the way we view the economic system. Small government, free trade, open markets, little regulation, all of those things were in there. And you'll find that they were also behind a lot of the think tanks which exist today. They're behind a lot of, a lot of the people in government, a lot of people Thatcher and Reagan, a lot of their advisors came from this Mont Pelerin society. They systematically changed the way we think about economics. And we need to do something similar again. It's going to be a long process, but that's what we want to do, to bring together. And there are lots of groups around today already in the US as well as in Europe who are trying to do this and we want to support and help them. But it's a systematic process to make people waken up and realize there's a different way forward.
you to choose. There's a gentleman back there who's been trying to get in for a while. So, and then, maybe, you could take the mic up there, because he's been trying for a while. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Chris Cook. I'm a senior research fellow at UCL and um, looking at resilience, which I was asked to after the financial crash when we came two hours away from the cash machines being switched off. Yeah. And I'm like you, I was in the belly of the beast. I was a director of what's now the biggest global energy exchange. Yeah. I designed the UK natural gas futures contract, so sorry about that. <laughs> but I was a few, two months ago, I was at World Energy Congress in Istanbul. All the great and the good are there, I had to get them a lot. <clears throat> And there's a sea change going on. And they recognize that there's an inflection point. It was Yamani said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the Oil Age didn't end because we were running out of oil. It's reached a level where it's too bloody expensive for people to be able to afford it. It's reached, they were saying that basically, they don't think it's going to stay over $50 a barrel ever again. Not for, not for long. Two reasons. One is, Solar is now 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour in Chile and decreasing. That's less than about $15 a barrel. Point one. Point two, the more expensive oil gets, the more profitable it is in dollar terms to save it. And that's where Exxon, Exxon talk about the fifth fuel. You know what the fifth fuel is? It's what's between our ears. We have a room full of the fifth fuel here. Energy efficiency, and I'll go back to what my study is looking at history. Do you know what James Watt's business model was? He went to the tin mines. He didn't sell his new pumps. He supplied them in exchange for a third of the coal saved. Pumping as a service. And we were hearing there in, in Istanbul about energy as a service. Not the nonsense of energy as a commodity. I said 20 years ago that electric, buying and selling electrons was bollocks. But they went ahead for 20 years and we're just about to see the lights go out because of that bollocks. Pardon my language. You've got a question. I'm just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. no question, but do you agree with my analysis no, that I, we're moving I, to I, energy I, as a service? I agree with you absolutely. The, 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 the absolutely. Um, the, the challenge with, with oil is, is that as we transition out of it, the demand will go down. And that means the price will go down. And so it will become more difficult for renewables to compete with something which is falling in price. And so we need to have some sort of market intervention. We need to have some way of making sure that we make that transition out of there. But I go back to the point I had before. It's not that we are missing the technology. We're missing the political will to make the transition. But yeah, I agree absolutely.